So I'm happy to see this kind of pause and um, let's take a little breath and, and actually see what these effects of all of these interest rate hikes have done. Because if we don't pause and kind of assess, we're just, I think, unnecessarily hiking interest rates, unnecessarily stressing the average Canadian household. And I think that, you know, from, from my interactions with clients day to day, realtors, accountants, lawyers, all of these things, there's a lot of stress that hasn't fully been realized in the market yet. Welcome everybody to another episode of Level Up. I'm Katie. I'm here with Daniel and we have a very special guest today. Michelle Ferruja, she is uh, the owner and uh, mortgage broker from Cognitive Capital. We have had uh, Michelle on our team meetings multiple times, and we're shocked that she hasn't been on our podcast yet. So we're so happy that she's finally here. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. No, we love all your insight. You're always uh, providing a lot of up-to-date information for agents. So we're so happy that you're here. Um, yeah, so let's let's kick it off with, you know, it's the day after the most recent interest rate announcement. What are your thoughts? Um, I am obviously excited, like I'm sure many Canadians are, just to see a hold. I do think, however, people need to manage their expectations in terms of what this means. Um, I think that we're kind of in an interesting spot right now where I think that we're actually a little bit stuck. You know, we're always talking about how do we get inflation down, but also mortgage rates contribute to inflation. So it's like if rates go up, inflation goes up. But if rates come down, that provides more access to credit for Canadians to then spend on other commodities, which would then increase inflation in another area and kind of contribute to overall inflation. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the logic behind the hold this interest rate hike uh, or announcement and the last one. Um, but it should be interesting to see because it feels like we're in a little bit of a standstill here. If we go up, inflation will go with that as well. But if we come down, we're allowing access to credit, which can then also increase inflation. So I think that we are going to be in a holding period for a little bit. I don't necessarily think that that means that there isn't a chance that there's one more rate hike. Um, I try my best to to pay attention to what's going on in the States as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The Fed has continued to be aggressive with rate hikes and uh, U.S. consumer spending has not been decreasing, and that's not something that we typically see when we uh, are kind of trying to get those interest rates up and, and ideally, you know, trying to edge us into a recession. So it's a little bit odd that we're still seeing spending that high. Uh, I, I mean, I think that that's the idea behind the hold is it's really important to, for, to understand. And I guess my question has been tied to what you were saying, like by holding, does that create the ability for the Bank of Canada to look at how things move in the absence of any sort of additional moves on their part, because now it's not changing, you know, the mortgage interest element of inflation. Will it allow some sort of clarity about whether holding is moving inflation up or down in order to influence future moves? Like, is that what it appears is the case? And then you also mentioned the Fed, like it does appear that's going to, at least in the short term, move up more or it is moving up more and historically we've followed that is there enough resistance to not have to keep following them even in the absence of inflationary change here so that's tricky so to the second part of your question like this is how it's always been um i do think however we have very different problems on either side of the border so it has always been confusing to me in recent years that we are trailing the u.s so closely. Um, I think that the two countries historically have had a lot of similarities, but I think that we're starting to notice that there's a lot of differences. Like we are dealing with a supply and demand uh, housing crisis that I just do not feel is as prevalent on that side of the border. And that brings a whole different dynamic to the situation. And then holding, and, and when we talk about in, inflation, inflation is a trailing metric. So it's very difficult for anybody to sit here and say, what's happening right now with inflation is as a result of X, because in reality, we're holding right now, trying to figure out how the chips are falling from things that happened three to six months ago. So I'm happy to see this kind of pause and um, let's take a little breath and, and actually see what these effects of all of these interest rate hikes have done, because if we don't pause 
and kind of assess, we're just, I think, unnecessarily hiking interest rates, unnecessarily stressing the average Canadian household. And I think that, you know, from, from my interactions with clients day to day, realtors, accountants, lawyers, all of these things, there's a lot of stress that hasn't fully been realized in the market yet. I know from your guys' side, you're seeing, you know, there's, I'm not good with the real estate stats, but there's a lot of listings coming on. Listings are showing to me, strange tendencies. Like people are like, okay, is it a buyer's market? Is it a balanced market? Because I'm still seeing listings that are uh, having bidding wars on them and, you know, are going well over ask, but then I'm, I'm seeing other listings that it's like crickets. They're on the market. Um, people are securing, you know, freehold properties in Toronto with a basement suite for under a million dollars. Uh, and it's, it's just a, it's a weird market. And yeah. I'm, I'm happy that we're going to hold and just kind of assess what's happening because I, I think we can't make empowered decisions if we don't have all the information. And if we keep hiking, knowing that inflation is a trailing metric without seeing how that kind of plays out, I, I just think that that's blind and it's stupid. It really is. Like I always thought it, it didn't make much sense, especially going into this year where things have just been so in flux over the last couple of years, like COVID just really messed everything up. And like mm -hmm. just using those metrics as a determination for what to do moving forward, it just seems so backwards. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. And as you said, the market, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of inventory hit the market. I'm seeing there's not like a, you know, set you know, obvious, you know, type of property that's selling well versus others. It seems to just be a mixed bag. Like some properties seem to just fly off the shelf and then others are just sitting there and they're really nice and they're priced reasonably. And when it comes to a buyer's market, like we are, I guess, guess when you look at the math, we're in a buyer's market territory, but when buyers are at such difficulty trying to afford homes, when it comes to the interest rates and all that, I don't really know if we can call it a buyer's market. I think it's kind of like no. a, just a shit market overall. It is. Yeah. And it's, it's like finding like a buyer, finding a seller that is yeah. desperate enough to let a property go. Yeah. Like that's kind of that, that middle ground that people are finding and you're seeing those deals go, but then there's other yeah. people who are not as desperate to let it go. They're like, if I can ditch this property, I will. And then if the right buyer comes along, who can happen to afford it at a price that I want? Amazing. But they're, they're very different, very different sides to the coin for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It seems like almost all the transactions on both sides we're seeing now are circumstantial tied to interest rates in different ways. Like sellers now are coming to us because, you know, my mortgage is coming up for renewal in February and I need to get out of here before that happens. And, and same sort of thing, buyers, maybe they have a, a rate locked in that's going to disappear and they need to get something done. But I haven't seen this much of a tie to rates with the decision-making process around buying and selling homes in a long time. I don't know if that's, mm -hmm. is that similar to what you're seeing in terms of the nature of the transactions and, and the motivations behind them? Yeah, for sure. But it's tricky because there's obviously an inverse relationship between the, the pricing or the cost of anything in this situation, particularly housing and the cost of credit and interest rates. What's interesting about, you know, housing as a as a commodity is that we are having this supply and demand problem. And I I find it funny. I go online, I see a lot of debates about, oh, people are always talking about supply and demand, but as when you actually step back and you look at how much interest rates have risen, the response in property prices should be significantly lower than it is right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we have a supply and demand problem going on. So, even if you know, there was some magical wand where we could increase interest rates, allow inflation to come down, which that's not really going to happen because three of the largest contributors to inflation right now are mortgage rates, oil prices, and rent. And rent to me is, you know, very correlated to interest rates, right? You're increasing um, the debt borrowed to, to create these properties and, and these living opportunities for Canadians. The cost of them is going to continue to rise for Canadians to access them. Um, I just, I don't, I, I don't think people, I, this is nice that, that, you know, the cost of housing is kind of cooling off. Um, and obviously I don't have a crystal ball, but I think that we are way too deep in shortage of homes for people to expect that the housing prices are going to reset yeah. because at the end of the day, like there is just not enough supply. Mm-hmm. 
to support yeah. the demand that we have. And that number continues to grow every single month. Yeah. No, there's, there's a considerable crisis that is on the horizon. Like people say that we're in, and it has been a housing crisis for what we're in, but you're right. The amount of development that continues to not happen as a result of things like this, mm -hmm. you know, there's not a future hope that we wanted to have that there's going to be an influx of tons of supply that's going to help quell this while at the same time, immigration numbers and all the things and young people who are trying to buy their first home that are increasingly unable the demand is continuing to get farther away from supply rather than the other way around. And it's scary. It is scary. And I think that there's so many other factors at play here. And, and, you know, we kind of touched on this before coming in, like at, you know, a, a government level, um, obviously they kind of went back on opening up the green belt. Fine. That's one thing, but what people are not realizing, I mean, not fine. That's one thing that's really messy in itself. Um, but what people are also not realizing is, the you know provincial government was was trying to kind of make it easier to you know get permits and building and what can i put here and in the process of them kind of going back on on opening up the green belt there they're also going back on and and reviewing an, a number of things and trying to give the power back to the municipalities which is kind of putting back up that red tape that we've worked so hard to try to eliminate so that we can start producing more supply. Um, and then, you know, there's things like the landlord tenant board, okay. you know, I definitely think tenants need to have an option to be protected, but it's like, how can you stand up here as a government and say, we are really dedicated to making sure that there's more access to housing uh, for Canadians. And, you, and you're asking Canadians who are, let's be clear, most landlords are not rolling in it. Most landlords are stretching themselves just like right to the line, trying so hard to create an opportunity of wealth for their future generations, but their, their room for error is very small. And, you know, landlords having no rights, people think that landlords are here cashing out, getting rich. When you're actually sitting here behind the scenes, most of them are breaking even if not losing money each month. They're tied into the long game, which is appreciation, ideally. So yes, there is a benefit to them, but how can you ask Canadians to open up their homes and create housing for other Canadians if you have no protection for that Canadian? Like, I have seen some crazy things. So somebody's just allowed to squat in my house and they can do that for a year. And I continue to have to pay the rent and the cost and go into debt and move towards bankruptcy because that is what happens to people when they have no course of action to take here. And then when you eventually get the tenant out, it's like, okay, well, we got them out, but you're still not getting money. You don't get to recoup your costs. It's like, how do, I don't know what the perfect solution is, but that is definitely not it. And it makes me really question how committed are our leaders to actually wanting to solve this housing supply issue? Because all of their actions are showing completely different things. Yeah. And as you pointed out, there's so many holes in every single system, like in nobody's talking together. It's like, you know, somebody makes a decision about, oh, let's open up this land or let's, you know, fix this one other thing. But if you're not working in conjunction with everything else, it's just like, you're not fixing anything. And so it's just, it's really frustrating to witness how, I, I don't know what it is. Like, I know we sit on the, on the, on the outside looking in, but I just, it, it, there's gotta be so much done that could be better. Um, especially on the landlord and tenant board side of things. Absolutely. And even, you know, there's specific products and, and real estate transactions that I think there's a lot of room for innovation on, um, you know, this variable rate product that has, you know, was the preferred option for people to be able to get their foot in the door of a, of a market that was getting higher and higher and faster and faster and bidding wars and bidding wars, you know, I needed to take this product to get in the door. And now this product is potentially going to make me lose everything. Like can, this, this payment not changing and then being able to grow, you know, we're talking about, um, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the word. What's the interest rate where you hit it? Oh, the, um, the trigger rate. There trigger we go. Rate. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, should there, should there be, you know, an opportunity to maybe come back and look at that and put like a peak and a bottom on it, like on yes. both sides of that, like you're taking on some risk, but can it cap out, um, on the upside or the downside somewhere? And then pre-constructions is a big one as well. Yes. I think I wanted to get into that. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I think that 
on the mortgage side, there needs to be a completely new set of regulations on the mortgage side surrounding pre-construction properties. I think it's absolutely nuts that you are expected to purchase a property in one market under, you know, a certain economic time, but also under your own income, your own credit. And you are then expected to commit 100% without fail to that debt, to that asset. But you have absolutely no idea what that's actually going to turn into by the time that you have to close on it. And if that's totally different, well, that's your problem. You need to figure it out. And who's to, who's to say that the closing date is even anything you planned it would be? It could be three, four years later than when you even are already guessing. So, exactly. Yeah. And that in itself is something like, can we not add some form of regulation surrounding that? Right. Because people are always talking about large corporations, builders profiting, all this stuff. At the end of the day, people need to make money. There's, there is no, um, there's no motivation for, for builders to take on that much risk. If it's not profitable, we're not talking about buying and selling apples. We're talking about millions and billions of dollars, but can we slide in a regulation where there's a time cap on your ability to, execute on a development. And if you do not do it at that time, you know, you need to give back deposits with, you know, a predetermined uh, interest return on that money or whatever it is. Yeah. It's just that whole process is incredibly confusing to me. And it's scary. The things that I'm seeing Canadians experiencing right now who got caught in the middle of that. And I mean, on, on the plus side, I wonder if we're at a point now where people have said, okay, obviously doing going the pre-construction route for a lot of people, not everybody. Like if people have got money and they can invest in a property and it makes sense, then yes, there are people that are still out there. But for the regular person who just figures I can either flip it for a good profit or I can be cash flow positive on this when when the time comes when it's ready to rent out, like it's very obvious that those two aren't going to be options. I don't think in our lifetime, we will see that opportunity come up anymore. Um, yeah. The, the cost in order for that opportunity, I think to make more sense also like the cost of building supplies needs to come down significantly because that was the really appealing thing about pre-construction early on is that you could get in at ground level. The cost to build was significantly lower, but the asset itself once completed because of that you know, we're edging into that supply and demand problem becomes, you know, significantly higher in value than the cost to actually create it. And now that that doesn't exist the same way anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you, yeah. You, you touched on something that, I mean, I really hope happens. It's something I know is being discussed and it hasn't yet come to fruition, which is, I mean, you talked about all the different stakeholders that have their own types of skin in the game in this issue, right? And in theory, everybody's trying to, on the surface, work towards the same outcome, which is more supply and, you know, let's keep the economy moving. But they're never in the same room together, or it doesn't seem they're in the same room together, right? You know, three levels of government, developers, stake, all the stakeholders. And there's a very quiet rumbling that there needs to be sort of a, a round table for lack of a better word where innovation and you know even just this podcast you've already put forward ideas for things that should be discussed more and i'm sure somebody somewhere has brought it up and it's a piece of paper somewhere but like it needs all the eyes like do yeah. you see a world or i mean I, I would assume you'd be in support of something like that where everybody could actually push forward the same narrative rather than relying on what I believe to be a finger pointing society where everybody would rather just make sure they have someone to blame rather than let's all just actually work together towards a common goal. You know, it, it's hard because this falls now outside of working towards common goals and where this actually lands to me, like my background is in psychology, human behavior, et cetera, is humans are innately selfish and greedy. And I think that there's so much corruption in our political system. People are throwing around, you know, words like communism in this country now. And, and it's just, even if you put them all in the same room, like I, I just, what yeah. is the motivation and like, who is, who is holding people to making sure that those motivations and intentions are correct? Mm -hmm. Like the fact that the green belt could even have been opened the way that it, that happened is like mind blowing to me. And I always come back to, you know, I like to think of myself as a realist. And I think what the average Canadian really needs to come to terms with is that you need to look out for you and yours. Mm -hmm. And you need to collaborate in your smaller communities within your family and your friends, because we're all sitting here looking up and, and hoping that these people are going to do the right thing. 
These mm-hmm. people, it doesn't matter what pedestal you put them on, they are humans. And when they get that carrot dangled in front of their face, not everybody has the right moral compass. So I don't know how that would work out when you put all of these people in the same room. Um, because I, I just look at the things that happen time and time again. It's like, why can all of us kind of smaller players here sit here and talk about the obvious issues? And obviously they're deeper than that. It's not that simple. Um, where do we get money from? Where do we do all these things? But I just think, you know, oh, I'm trying to be so like politically correct as I say this. Here. Um, I just think there's so much corruption. Like, yeah, in no, you're point. right. It's like, yeah. I, I don't know what everybody expects to happen. Well, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that even to say you could keep someone accountable with your vote or whatever, you're right. You're putting someone else in the same seat that has, you know, maybe a different overall view, but the overall view that supports their own mm. agenda. Yeah. So I agree with you. But at the same time, I mean, rather than say all is lost, <laughs> right, mm. you know, I think we do have to, maybe it is on a smaller scale, like addressing this with what you and I and most people look at as this seems so obvious why is nobody doing it you know that's what that that's where it gets really confusing and frustrating where it just appears that solutions are right in front of us and you're right it's not as simple as just do this and it'll all be fixed but there are steps that could and should be taken that aren't and it does appear that in a lot of cases the wrong dial is turned that does what you'd expect it to do in the wrong way yeah. And I think it's it's even harder for Canadians to process because it's not like these ideas are so foreign that they don't exist anywhere else. Like, I remember, you know, early pandemic, you saw this viral video going around of China, like popping up a hospital, like a massive mm-hmm. hospital in like 10 to 15 days. Building things is very possible at speed. There's obviously needs to be, you know, um, a nice happy medium between speed and safety. Like you guys know, I was in Colombia and South America last winter and I watched them put up an entire, I think it was like a 13 story condo building in Mm -hmm. like a month and a half. The safety there was a little questionable. Like I was watching it (laughs) from my condo across the street. I was like, holy shit, these guys are like wheeling and dealing and they got it done. But yeah, I just don't understand um, why things take so much longer here. I think that we do a poor job planning as well, right? Like I think that there was even from a public transportation um, standpoint, they put in a station and then they realized that they were going to like change around some subdivisions around it. So they filled in the station and then spent another, you know, number of billions of dollars starting it over. We, you're running countries like we have access to more intelligence than this. Like, I feel like I'm watching that, like, you know, that, that TV show where they do like the joke gags and they play like, pranks on people like that's what it feels like watching um our leaders just try to navigate these problems and i'm just flabbergasted i know it's it's mind blowing and you're right like some days i just feel so defeated especially lately which is all the news that's happening even beyond housing it's just like like what am i expected to do but i mean i think you are doing an incredible amount just with the education side of things and and just um you know supporting the industry um it's and i think that's all we can like whatever we can control we just try to do as much as we can on that front um but from like from your perspective like where is the need right now from your clients like when people are calling into you do you find that there's common issues or common opportunities that um people are are asking you about yeah definitely the resale versus pre-con one is something mm. going on right now um and i think you know we kind of talked about how the market's a bit of a mixed bag and you know i had a client for example last week i feel like they have a strong budget i feel like the property they're looking for is within their price point but they happened to walk into one of their property interests in milton that ended up with 30 offers on it okay. sold significantly higher and i'm just kind of like you need to not allow your interaction with one property to define it across the board because it is such a mixed bag right now um I also think, you know, a common thing that we're talking about is what is the right interest rate type? What is the right interest rate term? And as of right now, I still love a two or three year, but we're starting to see these rates edge towards uh, equilibrium with the variable rates, which we have not seen in a while. So I am curious to see, you know, variable does still feel very risky because at the end of the day, 
the interest rates could go up to 15%. Like we don't know. Um, but if the fixed rate starts to surpass the variable rate, and perhaps we do get a little bit more confidence from the Bank of Canada or whatever it is, I think we will start seeing some consumers try to jump over to a variable rate in order to catch it on the way down. Um, the Canadian bond yields uh, are very closely tied to the U.S. bond yields. So although there was a hold, I do expect us to continue to see uh, bond yields increase and, and then therefore, of course, fixed rates increase as well uh, for the next little bit anyway. So those are kind of the common things that we're talking about right now. Um, mm. I feel good, honestly, for the first time home buyers right now. I'm seeing a lot of people who were just totally discouraged, getting absolutely smoked for the last couple of years, starting to come back to the market and starting to be able to look at the market calmly because buying a house is intimidating enough. And then you tack on we just walked in the house, put an offer on it now, no conditions, no inspection. You need to know 100% certainty or you don't get it. Like that was a scary moment. So it's nice to be able to see first time home buyers, be able to walk around, look at different properties, take their time, um, know that there's deals to be had out there, know that they can throw a condition in for an appraisal and inspection, a financing condition. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing some people get some really awesome deals. Um, yeah. Those are the things we're yeah. talking about. Cool. Nice. I think you're right. Like it's the data finally of seeing days on market going up to a reasonable number, you know, and I don't even know what would be, but to see it at like 20 days, you know, even a year ago would have been unheard of a couple of years ago, like not even close. So, and to me, yes, even more than days on market, that condition approach, something that should be a no brainer. It was a no brainer the other way for too long where you couldn't even fathom having any sort of a contingency on an offer if you wanted a place. And now you can negotiate. I, I can think put for us- the conditional on sale of, of, of sale of your you can, house. Yeah. You, is that's actually an interesting one. I yeah. feel like that one's still a little bit of a toss up though. Like it I've is. seen yeah. people yeah. swing The sellers it. don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they're like, we're having a hard time selling our house. We're not allowing you to put a conditional yeah. sale in your house. I'm not well, stupid. It, it, it's a challenge <laughs> too. Yeah, Like it is a challenge because even homes that, you know- I guess from 10,000 feet look like easy sales, there's still, and will forever be an issue with seller expectations and them being willing to come down to earth and what reality is right now. Right. Because it's very hard when your neighbor sold a year ago for a hundred uh -huh. grand more. Um, so even, and that's, and that's another thing that's pushing big days on market is place people who just aren't going to give it up for the number that's actually out there, which has made it tough as well i think for for buyers and for sellers to to meet in the middle yep. um it's yeah. it's interesting but it's it's fun for our industry we've been saying for the last little bit like finally we're doing our job again you yeah. know like this is yeah. it's allowed us to be able to give advice and to negotiate and to not just say oh shit it's day zero on the market we better offer 500 grand over ask with no conditions and hope for the best right like that's yeah. not real estate so I know. And I, I think that, you know, realtors are more relevant now than ever, just based on the point that you just made, which is, you know, seller expectations. Um, and these are conversations that I'm having with sellers all the time. I feel like I have no business to touch this, but because I am a little bit, you know, kind of, um, there's space between me and, and what's happening in the real estate transaction. Clients will ask me for my opinion on things that their realtors say. And I just go, listen, I am not at all qualified to tell you what the value of this house is. What I can tell you is that if you have selected a realtor that you trust, you need to trust them wholeheartedly because if you get this wrong, you are going to screw yourself in the long run. If they're telling you that this property needs to be priced at, you know, such and such price because it's going to sell at such and such price and you just try to argue with them to get that a little bit higher on the list price and and you don't get the showings that you need, you don't get the opportunity to get those offers in the door. Days on market is not a positive thing um, on your listing if it just continues to sit there. It's basically just you opening house for people to say, meh, there's something wrong with this listing. It's 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 kind of garbage now, you know, and it just slowly the price trickles down. And I have seen a lot of really hard-headed sellers do that. Um, consumer education is incredibly important across the board, especially when markets get into this mixed bag space. Um, people really need to be thinking about the professionals that they're working with. Uh, they need to make sure that they're asking the questions, they're getting the answers to the questions that they're asking. And if you're not going to trust your professional, then just do it yourself. Sell your house yourself, 
go get your own mortgage yourself. Um, because these are people who work in the industry every single day and, and they know what's going on here. And I get it's emotional that your neighbor sold for 2 million and now you're selling for 1.5 or whatever it is, but the market determines the price yeah. and that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And so definitely a lot of conversations we're having right now with our agents and our clients and all that kind of stuff in terms of the stress test, what are your thoughts on that now that, you know, I know a lot of people when it was introduced and then there were some adjustments to it, they're like, this is bullshit. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. we're never going to get up to this price. Why are we being tested on it? And now it's like, oh, (laughs) so how do you, do you think that was effective? Do you think, would you say there's any improvements that could be made based on what we've seen over the last couple of years? Yeah. I, my answer to this question is both yes and no. Um, so I, on the yes side, like I, I think it's good is imagine if it wasn't there, how much messy, right. This would be. But on the no yeah. side, it's like, I think there's just so many things that it is not factoring in mm-hmm. and finding a line between protective policy and not discriminating is hard. Because what I think about, for example, a big one is daycare costs, right? Like it is not factoring in daycare costs. It is not factoring in gas costs. Um, And it's like, but but how could you also sit there and make policy surrounding people who have children versus not children, people who commute versus not commute? Like that would be a very difficult thing to do. I think perhaps there should be, and this is tricky because everything's so expensive, but imagine a world where there's like a policy of you need to have X percentage as a safety net in order to close on a property, right? Like we talk about, you need to have X percentage for closing costs. And, and, you know, we've gotten people used to this concept of saving. It's not a perfect calculation, but one and a half percent, maybe up to 3% for closing costs, depending on whether you're in Toronto, outside of Toronto, maybe up to 5% if you're doing pre-cons. Can we not kind of change that norm to make people start thinking that they need to have an extra $10,000 to close or an extra whatever it is to close? Like it's tricky when, you're trying to buy something that's so expensive and you're scraping together every last dollar and like just getting your foot in the door by like the last hair on your head and then thinking, holy shit, I need to save more money. But I don't know. It gets, it gets sticky. Responsible. Yeah. Like that's the thing. Like we're, I feel like everybody's so afraid of doing what's responsible. Like that's just what you should do, but to force that on people or when, you know, you have to shell out 200 grand in, uh, for down payment, like who has that money, let alone an additional, whatever you need for making sure if things you get go really crazy that you, you have something to fall back on. So the yeah. problem is that there's also like an underlying kind of social tone here that's going on, which is that people are adjusting to the concept that something that they've always believed is uh, a human right, which it is shelter is now becoming like, yeah. you know, an investment in a commodity. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's right, but it mm-hmm. is happened yeah. and it's, it's difficult. Like people are sitting there. Well, why do I have to spend $200,000 to keep a roof over my head? And then now you're throwing around concepts that I need to have another $20,000 in the bank account when it took me 10 years to even get to this point. Like mm. it's a very, mm. very difficult topic. It really is. It it does. It feels to people like the target keeps getting moved on them. Mm-hmm. I mm. think, you know, like I finally reached that finish line you told me about, mm-hmm. but it's not the finish line at all. Mm-hmm. And that that's a really tough pill to swallow. And it's understandable. Like yeah. it's very understandable. We see it all the time that- you know, the frustration is real. It's, it, it's valid. I think in a lot of cases, pretty Mm -hmm. much every case, you know, if people have done it responsibly, I think people who feel entitled to things for which they haven't prepared for is a different story, but for the most part, dealing with people who did what they were told to do and the goalposts are moved on them. What do you do? Right. You got to adjust to it because there aren't systems in place to say, all right, you were close. Let's 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 you get a house and you get a house and you get a house. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So as we wrap up, are there is there anything else that you know should be on the horizon we should be aware of as we enter the last part of this year? I'm just uh I'm really big on save your dollars and cents, like Mm. as kind of edge into recessions or or whatever it is. Cash to me is always king. I think a lot of people are asking themselves questions. Do I make a prepayment on my mortgage? Do I do this? Do I do that? And and my my general, uh, obviously this changes situation to situation, but my, my general consensus on this right now is you need to have money on you 
I think making lump sum prepayments, yes, if I do the math and we talk about, well, you know, offsetting interest paid versus what am I earning on a stock portfolio? I don't think the math maths, like it would in a lot of cases make more sense to dump money down on the debt. But what people need to remember is that the value of their properties are also declining and dumping money down on the debt. Does, you don't just get instant access back to that. So you need to qualify to take it out against a target, as we're talking about, that's continually moving and your, your borrowing power to be able to access that is continually declining. But then the asset itself is potentially depreciating and the money is just Evapor evaporating into to thin air in the in the interim, right? Because you don't realize gains or losses, obviously, until you liquidate something. But I think people really, really need to be looking at their spending, saving as many dollars as they can. Restaurants should not be as busy as they are right now. Like, I think that's a big thing. When I'm walking out or airports, you can tell what average consumers are doing and spending their money on. And I think a lot of money is still being spent because people are exhausted. But make the responsible decision, eat at home. You know what I mean? Watch your dollars, cut spending where you can make sure that you have a little bit of a safety net on you so that you can kind of quote unquote, weather the storm and adjust your expectations of how quickly this is going to go back to normal, so to speak. Um, you know, Benjamin Tal, you guys know, I'm a fan of him. He mm -hmm. mentioned uh, in a conference a week and a half ago that he's expecting rate hikes to come down in the summer. I think it's more so going to be the back half of next year and it's going to be slow. It's going to be steady. Um, and we don't even know if we're at the top yet. So I think it's going to be two to three years before we find our new normal. And I think people need to have cash on hand to manage whatever may come with that. I think that's, I Wise words. More. I couldn't agree more. And, and I guess people's perspective of what normal is needs to be, I think, checked also because normal doesn't mean what it was, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think normal is where it settles is what normal is going to be. Yeah. And who knows how long the next normal lasts before it's a normal after that, right? The world is yeah. a weird place. I know. But Very true. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Where can everybody find you? Because all of our agents love working with you. And I know a lot of agents out there that are listening will love working with you as well. So where can they find you? I got myself back on social media. You guys know I took like a hiatus, but um, you can get me at M L Faruja. That's my last name. Um, M L F A R R U G I A on both Instagram and I popped on to TikTok recently. Yes, you're you're killing it on bit. TikTok. Been, you're doing awesome. <laughs> I've been doing okay on TikTok. Um, yeah, I'm always open to chatting with people. It's not hard to find my email or my phone number, uh, business phone number yeah. online. Uh, Cognitive Capital Inc. www.cognitivecapital.ca. If people have questions, if you're foresighting things for the future, like reach out. I have people closing on pre-cons in three years who are wanting to have discussions about them now or renewals that are coming up in a year and a half. It's so much better to be prepared. And myself and my team are always happy to connect with people about it. So, yeah. And I mean, we I know we talked about this on the government level, but in terms of like just your perception and just your genuineness for wanting to help. Like that is so clear when, when you talk to Michelle, so you'll see that. And she's super accessible. Like I've had situations where my clients just not sure what to do. And they like, they're, they're at the point of having to make a decision and like, Michelle's not even involved in the process, but she's willing to help. And I mean, obviously don't go to her for those kinds of things all the time, no, you but can. she's always like willing to help. And that's what I really appreciate. Yeah, no, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, this is my craft and I believe in like good karma and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah. I have access to this information, I'm happy to share it with whoever, whether I'm involved or not involved, I, I'm happy to give my two cents on it. So don't be shy. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Michelle. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Level up, level up, level up, level up. Level up.